So we've, uh, we've been trying to take a look at uh, the historical context of some of the things that we read about in, in our Bible. And today I wanted to talk about um, the Canaanites. We read about the Canaanites uh, all the time. And we just kind of gloss it. It, 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 it. It's a word. Oh, the Canaanites. Yeah, the bad guys in the land. In the land. But who were the Canaanites? Who were these people? And uh, I want to take a look about it. At that, the uh, <clears throat> the completeness of iniquity is what I'm calling this because uh, in Genesis, uh, when God was promising Abraham that he was going to be taking possession of this land, he said, "For, the, for uh, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete." And we're going to talk about what that is. But let's first talk about who the Canaanites were. Here's a map if you can read it, uh, of uh, the Canaan before the conquest. And so we see the Canaanites uh, uh, specifically a as distinguished from the Canaanites. The, you know, everybody who lived in Canaan was a Canaanite. But these were the peoples known as uh, the Canaanites. There's the Hittites. The Hivites were up here. Here are the Gergesite, uh yes, the Gergesites, here are the Hivites. What am I reading up there? Is it both? Okay. Um, also Canaanites in here, the Jebusites around Jerusalem, here's Hittites, Amorites, Moabites, Edomites, Amorites over here. So um, we might come back to that. Uh, nonetheless, I wanted to at least show the map. So who were the inhabitants of Canaan, and what do we want to learn from them? In Deuteronomy 7, uh, verse 1, when the Lord thy God shall... Is this out of focus? Maybe a little bit. Oh, much gooder. There we go. Okay. When the, yeah, that's right. <clears throat> when the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. These are the Canaanites that got, got tossed. In Genesis 10, 15 18, um, we have a little bit of genealogy here, just to give you some, some background on, on who, who begat who. Canaan was the father of Sidon. Now, Canaan, of course, was the grandson of Noah and the son of Ham. Uh, Canaan became the father of Sidon, his firstborn, Heth, and we'll see Heth was, the Hethites were the Hittites. Uh, we'll get into that. Jebusites, the Amorite, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Archites, the Sinites, the Ar Arvidites, the Zemorites, the Hamathites, Hamathites, and afterward the families of the Canaanite were spread abroad. Now, not everything that is in that genealogy did we just read about over here. So we go to an extra biblical uh, source, Josephus, who took it upon himself to do genealogies of who the, who the inhabitants were. And in there, we see a, a lot more. Um, we have the Sidonites that were, that were called out. Uh, the Hamathites were, were called out there. Um, but in, it's, it's this last point that we want to go through because... Uh, it's there where we get the Gergesites, because there were, there, Gergesis wasn't mentioned in the previous, in the previous genealogies. And so <clears throat> uh, there's, there's ample evidence to say that these were all the descendants of Canaan. Now what's interesting, if we go all the way back to the map, the Philistines aren't, aren't part of this. The Philistines are not descended from, uh, from Canaan. And we'll, we'll see that in a, in a couple of minutes. So I want to go through them one at a time, just a little bit of context, historical background on the Hittites, or on each one. The Hittites, of, let me go back, each one of the seven that were mentioned, the seven nations mightier and more numerous than now. So the Hittites <clears throat> were the sons of Heth. The Hethites equals the Hittites. There's a fair amount of confusion about the Hittites because there was a large, large empire known as the Hittite Empire. We talked uh, in a previous lesson 
about how the the covenant treaty or the covenant parallels the the uh, the peace treaties that were imposed by the Hittites. Those were the, not these not these Hittites. Those were the Hittites of the Hittite Empire. The Hittite Empire encompassed what almost all of what's modern day Turkey and spread uh, out a little bit from there. Whereas these Hittites uh, that were descended from Heth, descended from Canaan, were a relatively small people group that inhabited Canaan. But here's where the confusion comes in. <clears throat> what, whether or not the Hittites uh, here and the Hittites uh, of the other empire, why, why does that get confused? Because both are probably mentioned here in the Bible. <clears throat> During the siege of Samaria by Ben-Hadad, remember we've talked about this in previous Sunday schools uh, when we're talking about uh, imputation, how much are goods worth. Samaria was under siege by Ben-Hadad and um, th they were selling, they were selling uh, little patties of, of bird poop for food because nobody had anything to eat. Women were eating their children, etc. And because the siege was, was so effective in Samaria. And <clears throat> um, so that's what we're talking about here. But in 2 Kings 7, 6, we have a reference to Hittites. And these Hittites are probably the, the empirish, the Turkish Hittites because of the context in which we read this. For the Lord had caused the army of the Arameans to hear a sound of chariots, Ben-Hadad being an Aramean, uh, and a sound of horses, even the sound of a great army. So they said to one another, behold, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. The kings of the, Egypt is big, right? We, we know that. Egypt was a very, very powerful nation and big. And in this, in this context, we're talking about the Hittites right next to the kings of the Egyptians. We're probably not talking about these little Hittite tribes uh, or, or nations inside of Canaan that were the Hethites. We're probably here talking about the large Turkish Empire Hittites. So this is where the confusion comes into play, is that in one case we're talking about a, a relatively small people group, and here we're talking about a big nation. So Hittites, just contextually, when you read about the Hittites, understand that there were the Hittites, and then there were the Hittites in, in, in Canaan. Historical context is what we're going for. Yes, Sid. Uh, probably the the Hittites of the Anatolia. The scholars argue why were they called Hittites? Because they, they were actually um, oh, now I forgot the name of the, there was another tribe up there, but somehow or another in a transcription uh, in ancient text it went to Hittites, but they probably were not. I think they were Harians or Hurrians or something along those lines. Yes, but nobody's gonna change that now because of, we have so many history books written on, on that. There's a possibility that these guys were somewhat related in the northern, the northern section there. These guys may have been related to the Turks who were up there, okay. right? So, um, so there are the Hittites, the Girgashites. Uh, Josephus gave us that name, Gergesus. We had looked at in the, some of the genealogies that, that he uh, put together. As one of the sons of Canaan, it's not list, Gergesus is not a name listed in the Bible. We have that extra biblically. It's the least understood of the seven nations that were dispossessed. Um, there's very little known about them except that they're written about. They're written about in the, in the narratives of the conquest. Um, and they're not mentioned in every listing. So they must have been relatively minor. Uh, and then we know that they dwelt there near, near the Sea of Galilee. And that's what we know about them. That, that's about it. 
there's very little in history, um, and it's we've got the the Bible accounts that they were there. <laughs> the Amorites. Josephus names Amorius uh, as a son of Canaan. We don't have that name in the Bible either. Um, interesting. Uh, in the context, Sihon and Og, which we read about uh, regularly in the conquest, as Moses and the, and the Israelites were approaching the, the promised land, they wanted to pass through the kingdoms. God had said specifically, don't go through the Moabites, don't go through the Ammonites. You take this, you take this route. Moses petitioned these Amorites to go through they would not deviate from the highway, and they wouldn't take anything but perhaps some water. And these guys, uh, Sihon and Og, sent out their troops to uh, to attack them. Well, the, the Israelites made short work of them, which is part of what put the fear of the Israelites into the, uh, the inhabitants of Jericho. Rahab talks about, you know, we heard about what what's happened out there. So Sihon and Og, they were Amorites. Um, they were west of the Jordan, and then there were, we saw that there were some also east of the, east of the Jordan. Uh, they were pretty big, and the Amorites um, are often used, the word Amorites is often used just like Canaanites to refer to the people. And we'll, we'll see that in a minute. Um, the Og's territory, it was no small thing. Og had 60 fortified cities in his in his. Uh, and that's mentioned in the Bible. We just kind of read over those things. So it was no small thing for the Israelites to pound Og and capture their cities and use that as part of the inheritance of Israel. Uh, Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh ended up with the Amorite uh, territory that was uh, east of Jordan. Um, plenty of Amorites west of the Jordan, uh, and we'll see, we'll see a little bit about that. Joshua defeated an alliance of leaders led by the Amorites in Joshua 11. Um, Adonai Zedek, if you remember the name, um, the king of lightning, uh, put together a confederation of tribes to try to defeat the Israelites under, under Joshua. Uh, they were defeated. Um, so the Amorites were pretty well crushed by the Israelites, although they didn't completely get rid of them. They, 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 did, uh, they did survive. Their descendants survived and moved east and north of Canaan, became nomadic warriors. They grew in power. Eventually, the Amorites founded Babylon. I don't think I knew that. Hammurabi was king of Babylon. Hammurabi was an Amorite. Interesting. The Canaanites. Canaan was, of course, the son of Ham, grand, grandson of Noah. Uh, they're distinguished from the other nations uh, who were dwell. They were dwellers along the coast. We saw that on the map. Tyre and Sidon were Canaanite uh, towns. Uh, the root of the word Canaan actually means purple. The people of Tyre were known as makers of purple. Uh, Tyre and Sidon were great hubs of commercial activity, and the word Canaanite has actually been used in the Bible as a synonym for uh, trader or merchant. We saw, I think in uh, Zephaniah and uh, maybe once in Amos as well. The Perizzites. There was no son of Canaan mentioned for Perizzites. Perizzite means uh, the villagers. So uh, the, the name it's more or less talking about where these people lived or how these people lived. They were more rural. They weren't living in walled cities. They were probably uh, herders and uh, uh, farmers. It was located to the south and southwest of Mount Carmel. It's where Abraham and Lot's uh, herdsmen fought about uh, there's not enough uh, grazing here for both our herds. They were fighting over wells um, and in that territory. So, to get just a little more context, the parasites, they were mentioned in 21 out of 27 times in the lists, uh, and their lands were assigned to Ephraim, Manasseh, and Judah. The Hivites were probably a branch of the, of the Hittites. Again, this gets a little bit fuzzy. It's, it's, it's not so clear 
about where all these people come from, although they are identified. It's, uh, there's, there's not much to be found. They were scattered over Palestine from uh, Mount Hermon to Gibeon. In the south, uh, their name is also like uh, the Perizzites, is Midlanders or villagers. Um, at the time uh, that Jacob came back to Canaan, Canaan uh, Hamor the Hivite was prince of the land. We see that uh, as a mention. They are next mentioned in the conquest, and they principally inhabited then the northern confines. A, a remnant of them still existed in the time of Solomon. He put them to forced labor, to slave labor. And uh, if you remember Shechem, Shechem was the Hivite who uh, raped Dinah, and, uh, but loved Dinah and wanted to marry Dinah. And so if you remember, that's an ugly story. It's the reason that Levi and, uh, and um, Simeon were essentially disinherited by Jacob because, okay, Shechem says, wait, I, I want to do right by Dinah. I want to marry her. They say, oh, you can't marry her without becoming Jewish. You have to be circumcised. And all, your, all the men of Shechem needed to be circumcised. Well, they did that. Great. You know, I mean, they're showing their commitment. Grown men who are circumcised are gonna hurt for a while, right? You're gonna be sore. I mean, it makes you kind of bend over just thinking about it. Uh, as they were trying to heal up, Simeon and Levi attacked the town and slaughtered them because they were pretty much defenseless because they couldn't move. And much against Jacob's, I mean, Jacob was infuriated by that and so he he disinherited them and called them sons of violence. Um, but that's Shechem, and he was a, a Hivite. The Gibeonites, if you remember, the Gibeonites are the ones who, after the conquest, uh, approached Joshua, and they forgot to inquire of the Lord whether or not they should make uh, a treaty with these people. They, they pretended, they lived there in Canaan, they pretended that they were coming from way far away, uh, they, they, they wore old clothes, they, they packed their, their livestock with old moldy food, and they fooled the Israelites into thinking that they'd come from a long distance. And they made a, a treaty with them that they wouldn't destroy them, and then it turned out that they were from right down the road. The Gibeonites were Hivites. The main Hivites were Gibeon, uh, Chavira, Beeroth, and kirjath Jiriam. The Jebusites, we know about Jebusites because Jerusalem was inhabited by the Jebusites. Uh, Jebus was the third son of Canaan. The Jebusites inhabited Jerusalem. Melchizedek was a Jebusite. Um, they were never fully driven from the land under Joshua, um, although they were, they were defeated, but they persisted until the time of the judges into the book of Samuel. Uh, David defeated the Jebusites take Jerusalem, and we'll, we'll talk about this uh, in a little bit. There's some very interesting rabbinic uh, um, tradition that surrounds the Jebusites and David's taking of, of Jerusalem. Uh, I think we'll get into that Oh, right now. Araona, also known as Ornan, was the Jebusite. He received the purchase price of the city. David actually paid for the city of Jerusalem. But here's the tradition, Abraham made a co that Abraham made a covenant with the Jebusites when he purchased the cave of Machpelah. That's where he buried his wife. It's known as the cave of the patriarchs. Uh, he, when he purchased that cave, he made a covenant with them that he would never take control of the city without their permission. And that covenant was inscribed on bronze statues of a blind Isaac and a lame Jacob at a later time. And so, I mean, essentially they're idols with a covenant written on them. But that's that the, the rabbinic tradition is that the Israelites could never take Jerusalem because of this covenant. Now, you, you could make the case that the, the Jebusites invalidated their covenant when they rebelled and, and tried to attack the Israelites. But at any rate, when we see uh, this reference to the blind and the lame in 2 Samuel 5, 6, that would fit into this tradition that said 
those bronzes were there. And so uh, David persuaded Joab to go into the city and destroy the bronze covenant statues and that that's what allowed them to take the city. But then David made good on Abram's covenant by paying for the city. So this is an interesting amalgam of rabbinic tradition and biblical history. So where do, where do we fall? I don't know exactly, but it's just what we're trying to do is get some context for when we read about the Hivites and the, and the Jebusites and the Girgashites, that's the whole point here, is to get some background. So uh, when jo for Joab having done that, David made him captain of, captain of his armies. Here's another interesting little tidbit. Our old friend Yasser Arafat, the Palestinian, claimed Jebusite heritage in order to be able to make a more valid claim on Palestine, on Jerusalem, saying, hey, I'm a Jebusite, I have, you, you Jews want to claim Jerusalem because it's in the Bible, well, I'm in the Bible too, I'm a Jebusite, this is our place, and you guys took it. So it's, it's just, isn't it interesting that people still look to the Bible for their justification? Interesting. Um, now, I put the Philistines in here as honorable mention, even though they're not sons of Canaan. They inhabited the Canaan land. Uh, they occupied the southwest uh, along the coast. The Greek rendering of the word Palestinii uh, gives the modern name of Palestine. It's interesting. Uh, they believe, it's believed that they originated in Crete um, because of their maritime history. They're known as the Sea Peoples in many, write, many writings, although I couldn't find that in the Bible. Um, they were innovative workers in iron, and they had superior technology because of that. Uh, we read about that in, in the Bible, where the Israelites at one point had to go to the Philistines to get their iron tools, um, because the uh, Israelites were still working in bronze. Uh, the Philistines knew about iron and steel, and uh, so uh, they had that superior technology, and it's why the Israelites couldn't overcome the Philistines so easily. Um, and they're not mentioned at all in the conquest of Canaan, but they inhabited the land. So there, there they are. <clears throat> Speaking of Yasser Arafat, I remember reading the thing when he was alive, of course, he was talking about testifying in the war against the Philistines. He mentioned David versus Goliath as a Palestinian. Connection with Philistine and Palestine, and saying that that is a that was that, that was a wall that still needs to be made right. Mentioned that specifically. I had never heard that before. Yeah. Interesting. Right. Who Canaan is. Canaan is the son of Ham, who is the son of Noah. When Noah went on the, on the boat, on the ark, he went on with his three sons, um, Shem, Japheth, and, uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham then had uh, several sons. Canaan, I believe, was the fourth son, um, but he, it's Canaan, and we'll get into this very shortly. Might as well right now. We'll follow up here shortly, okay? Because there's, I, I have some slides on this. Now, in Genesis 15, 16, when uh, Abram was questioning God, how do I know for certainty that I'm going to be here in this land? And God rehearses what's going to happen and talks about how the Israelites will go into captivity. And then, here's what he says. They shall come back here in the fourth generation, which is to say that you aren't going to get this land right now. And why not? Because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. What, what, 
how, what are we supposed to get from this? The completeness of iniquity. It's e easy to read over that and think, well, yeah, things are going to get pretty bad. And then we leave it at that, right? Pretty bad. Amorites, okay, we're good. Well, why were the Amorites signaled out? How bad is pretty bad? Well, commentators mostly agree that the Amorites are called out here as representing the entire Canaanite population. Um, mostly because they seem to have been the most widespread. If you remember our map from the very beginning, they were a big, big blob on the west, on the east side of the Jordan, and a little bit of, a little bit in south of uh, Jerusalem and the Jebusites. There were a lot of Amorites. Uh, remember too, the Amorites ended up being uh, the Babylonians. Um, keep, in keep in mind too that Abram confederated with several Amorite men uh, to pursue and defeat those invading kings. Remember when Cheddar Lammer came down with five kings and this, uh, or four and uh, attacked the king of Sodom and king of Gomorrah and ran off with Lot. When Abram went to retrieve them, he was confederated with a couple of Amorites. So in, in Abram's mind, the Amorites might have been the Canaanites. That's, that's an easy jump to make. And so in the context, overall context, it's easy to say, okay, the Amorites represent the Canaanites. Thank you, military historian, military historian Seth Brown. Yeah, good. Um, the mixing of terms is evident in the Bible. Numbers uh, 12, 44, and 45 says that the Amalekites and the Canaanites were the first to defeat Israel. Uh, yet in Deuteronomy, um, oops, it says the Amalekites. I mean, meant the Amorites. Um, Jerusalem is said to be ruled by an Amorite king in Joshua 10, but elsewhere Jerusalem is said to be inhabited by Jebusites, which that was the case. Um, and it's similar to calling Jews uh, after Judah, it's similar to calling Holland after, the uh, Netherlands after Holland because it's their best known province. Um, so Amorites, the, the iniquity of the Amorites, the iniquity of the Canaanites, the iniquity of the Canaan land, was not yet full. Um, Amorites refers to the nation and nations being judged uh, and replaced with Israel. So what constitutes a completeness of iniquity? From Leviticus 18, 1 to 5, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do what is, what is done in the land of Egypt where you live, nor are you to do what is done in the land of Canaan where I'm bringing you? You shall not walk in their statutes. You are to perform my judgments and keep my statutes to live according with them. I am the Lord your God, so you should keep my statutes and my judgments by which a man may live. If he does them, I am the Lord. And we read, when we read Leviticus, we're coming to Leviticus with the mindset of, okay, laws. God is spewing out the laws. God's spewing out the laws. But, I don't know how many times I've read this, I've just read over this. Nor are you to do what is done in the land of Canaan where I'm bringing you shall not walk in their statutes. God is saying that these things that he is about to enumerate are what the Canaanites are doing. And so all these nasty things, all the ugly things, are what the Canaanites the Amorites were doing. It's the fullness of their iniquity. In, in verse 24 and following, he gets really much more specific. And again, at least my mind goes to, well, let's get to the list of the laws. So let's, let's go through these laws. But he says, don't defile yourself by any of these things. For by all these, the nations which I am casting out before you have become defiled. The land has become defiled, therefore I have brought its punishment upon it. So the land has spewed out its inhabitants. 
You talked about this, Joel, in a Mars talk when you were talking about pollution. What is pollution? This is pollution. The land was being polluted, defiled. And, the, and the, the land is spewing out the inhabitants. As for you, you're to keep my statutes, my judgments, and not do these abominations. Neither the native nor the alien sojourns among you for the men of the land who have been before you have done all these abominations, and the land has become defiled, so that the land will not spew you out should you defile it as, as it has spewed out the nation which has been before you. It's very clear that what God is, is saying in, is... In, in covering all this is that this is what these nations have done. For whoever does any of these abominations, those persons who do so shall be cut off from among their people. Thus you are to keep my charge that you do not practice any of the abominable customs to which you have been practiced before you so as to not defile yourselves with them. I am the Lord your God. So the entire context of Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20 because he rehearses those same things in Leviticus 20, saying the nations there have done all these things. And kind of by implication, the admonitions in Leviticus 19, where he doesn't say exactly that's what these nations have done, but that entire context is saying why God is vomiting them out of the land and why the Israelites were justified in taking over. God is bringing punishment where punishment was due. So here's the ugly list. What are the abominations? What are the what is the completeness of iniquity? And here's the ugly list. Uncovering the nakedness of mom, dad, sister, brother, and aunt, and uncle, etc. It's a great deal in, in in Leviticus 18, at the very beginning, where it talks about thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of. And many verses go through that. What does that mean? It's talking about incest. It's talking about uncovering the nakedness of your mother would be to sleep with your mother. It's incest. To uncover the nakedness of your father might be to have relations with your father. Now that could be for a daughter, could be for a son. It could mean if, when you uncover the nakedness of your father, it could mean that you're sleeping with your mother because your, your, your father's wife, your mother, would be considered to be part of your father. When we read about Noah, gets off the ark, he plants a vineyard, he gets drunk on the wine of the vineyard. Remember what happened? He lay in his tent uncovered. And Ham, his son, went in and looked upon his father's nakedness. He had uncovered his father's nakedness. What does that mean? Because when Noah found out about it, he cursed. And who did he curse? He didn't curse Ham. He cursed Canaan. All kinds of speculation about what's going on here. In the context of uncovering the nakedness of mother, father, etc., it's most likely that what we're looking at there in that account is a power play on the part of Ham to take over the family. Do you remember when um, Absalom was trying to take over the kingdom from David? What's the first thing he did? He slept with David's concubines. As a matter of establishing his power, his authority. This man can do nothing about it because I'm having my way with his wives. Dan. I understand. It's an ugly... I believe, I believe that Ham's uncovering of his father's nakedness was that he slept with his own mother to, to establish his power in the family. Because what did he do? The first thing he did is he got out of the tent and he told his brothers, I'm, 
I'm in power here. I'm in. The, I'm one in authority. Because dad's dad's out of control. Dad's dad's lost it, right? I believe that that's what was going on. Why was Canaan cursed? Canaan. Now this is extra biblical, but Canaan may have been the result of the relationship. Or, there's speculation that Canaan was already born and part of the abuse that was going on. Um, it's, it's a very, very ugly story. But when you deal with the... When, when you use the Bible to interpret the Bible, and it's very clear here in Leviticus that the uncovering of nakedness has to do with relations, sexual relations of some sort, that Ham's uncovering the nakedness of his father with there was some sort of sexual perversion that happened there. And Canaan is the one... Was, uh, and Canaan was just one of the sons of Ham, uh, but Canaan's the one who bore the curse. We hear, we, in history, you often hear about the curse of Ham because it's uh, traditional to say that Ham is the father of all the black races, right? And that the curse of Ham, which is actually the curse of Canaan, where you will be a slave to your brothers is, was used oftentimes to justify chattel slavery of black people, the curse of Ham. That, that, uh, that black people are cursed by Noah and carry that curse around. When indeed it's, it's only it's the curse of Canaan, not the curse of Ham. So it's, it's, 